we want to hopefully hear from you guys more tonight. Um, we'll do a brief overview of what our process was like, um, how this story got to us, what we did with it uh, for the seven months, what we needed to do to wrap it up, what we found, um, and hopefully what we're hoping to um, keep doing um, in regards to water. So I can start. Um, we started on this project because, so the Tribune has done a lot of work surrounding um, Lake Michigan water, the Chicago River, and a lot of it has to do with water quality or um, kind of off um, one-off stories about you know a town here and a town there and we wanted to sit down and figure out how does Lake Michigan water get from there to people's taps and what the differences are in payment um, what the differences are because of you know why why there are differences if there are any and it just seemed like a, a like a largely untapped um, if you'll, so, so to speak. The uh, are just going to keep flying here. <laughs> just really flowing and flowing. So that's, that's kind of the premise that we, that we started on. And um, yeah, I don't want to keep talking. Oh, that's fine. Go okay, ahead. Okay, so, so we, we want to take a look at uh, how Lake Michigan water gets from the cribs and lake, which you guys see probably uh, often. There, there's, uh, there's five of them, but only two of them are really operational. Uh, you'll, they're about two miles out uh, and from the shore to your faucets, uh, and our, our mission was to uh, do sort of explanatory journalism with what we call a watchdog sensibility. So we wanted to follow money, we wanted to follow um, uh, the network, and it's a very Byzantine um, setup. So uh, the initial the, the initial way we did it was that uh, we. Um, we relied on data and, and information from uh, a, a local uh, planning organization that had uh, listed all of the rates for all of the 163 or so uh, publicly managed Lake Michigan water systems. So Wheaton or Naperville or uh, Schomburg or uh, you know, South and Orland, um, uh, mostly all the suburbs. So, and it's something like 80%, I think, of, and that's probably conservative, 80% of the people in the Chicago region get Lake Michigan water. So, uh, when we took a look at the rates, uh, what we found was that there is an enormous amount of uh, variability. So, there are some folks that charge uh, by thousands of gallons. There are some folks that charge uh, by hundreds of cubic cubic feet, right? Was that what it was, Patrick? Mm -hmm. And some charge, some, some have uh, s different service fees, uh, infrastructure fees. Uh, and so our, our, our mission was to try to level all of that out, to make sure that the, the rate we had for uh, someone in Bloomingdale uh, could be compared to someone's rate in Elmhurst or uh, in Mount Prospect. Um, and so that took an enormous amount of just, just time and work. Uh, a lot of it was data related, which was Cecilia's uh, responsibility, but a lot of it was uh, calling up and emailing each of these 163 communities, which is what we wound up doing, because some of the data we got was uh, just inaccurate. And, um, and so, that's what we did to sort of get a, a, a sense of, um, again, sort of a, a level of playing field and apples to apples uh, sort of comparison. So we went for 5,000 gallons, which was a kind of a universally accepted um, usage for the average family for a month. So everybody uh, who took a look at, at, um, at our rates could see what, um, they would pay for 5,000 gallons of water per month usage. And um, I don't know, so, but we also, you know, we were, it, it's a story also that um, can be really, really numbers heavy. Uh, and we were uh, made very aware by our editors that they did not want too many numbers because folks' eyes glaze over if you didn't too many numbers. So we had to 
go out into the world and a lot of these communities, uh, knocking on doors, making phone calls, and trying to um, give folks a sense of what the impact is um, of paying rates uh, that could be, that were very different, very disparate. Um, and then maybe I'll, maybe I'll let you talk about some of the rates that we found, some of the rate disparities we found. So we found um, that some communities, poor communities, uh, minority communities, were paying significantly more for water than those that weren't. Uh, Maywood, Dixmoor, Ford Heights were some of the communities that stood out. And as Ted mentioned, based on the data, then we did some reporting with real people to try to determine how this was affecting their day-to-day -day lives. And we um, basically did old, you know, to use the old-fashioned term shoe leather reporting by going door to door, by um, submitting some freedom of information requests for water um, shutoff data, people that have had their water shut off because they couldn't keep up with their bills. That's how we found people. Um, we got these huge stacks of documents with addresses in there, and we tried to find blocks that had a lot of houses where people were either behind on their bills or they hadn't been keeping up. And so that's how we were able to locate some of the subjects in our story, people that have, would come home from work and have their water shut off or were so hard, far behind in their bills that um, they, couldn't, they couldn't keep up or they tried to come up with a payment plan but they didn't have any running water, people that were um, showering at relatives and neighbors' houses and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we based our reporting off of the data that we got from the individual communities and the comparison that we made uh, with the data. Um, the other thing that I should probably mention is that the second part of the story was water loss data. So um, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources keeps records of how m water systems are being run. Municipal water systems that use Lake Michigan water are required to submit these documents to IDNR um, on how their system is doing. And what we found was there is a staggering amount of water that is lost before it ever reaches your apartment or your house if you get Lake Michigan water. 30%, um, 38%. Um, the standard is supposed to be uh, with 12, 10, 8 percent, depending on the years going forward. And so that was the second main part, was talking about how people are paying these sometimes exorbitant rates of, for water. Fort Heights, for instance, charges it's 85 flat fee per month for water, 75 if you're a senior, which um, obviously depending on where you live, but that, that's an incredible amount of water, flat, no matter how much water you use. Um, and so then what we did was, and uh, this is primarily Cecilia's doing, I'll let her talk about this in a second, but we built this graphics in the database to try to, so you could go in, type in your city or town, or if you're just curious, and say, okay, what does Maywood pay for water? So I'll have Cecilia take through the, uh, the graphics that we have. Sure. Yeah, um, so what this project amounted to when we got it um, and when we decided how are we going to, you know, wrap our hands around it and what's the story, um, we, uh, you know, there was a lot of, there was a combination of um, traditional reporting, shoe leather reporting, trying to FOIA for documents, things that had to be filed with the state, things that, you know, we were getting ourselves, data sets that we were building ourselves, and at the end of it, we wanted to have a place where this would all live. Um, a lot of the feedback that we got from our editors, but also other people who were working with water, was it'd be really neat, you know, if you guys could show all of this in one place. And sometimes, when you know your life is water, you forget to talk to other people. Um, but we tried to we tried to not do that. Um, so what we did and what we wanted to show was kind of a spectrum of what the what the median of the price was that people were paying in the region for the water. Um, when we standardized those amounts, we tried to keep sewer and other charges out of it to, so that we could compare um, as well as, as possible. And we did have those documents from the state that had um, loss figures, um, so standard, again, 12%. Um, we also were interested in 
this idea of distance. Um, we want it to be as thorough as possible. So one of the things we were wondering, our editors were wondering, everybody wonders, you know, what if the town is just really far away and you need to deliver the water to, you know, town A, B, C, D, and by the time it gets to D, it's a lot because it's far. Um, so we try to track wholesale rate amounts as well and try to see whether that alone accounted for how much more the, the price difference was for some of the outlier towns, or not the outlier towns, but the, the highest towns. Um, what we found is that distance alone didn't account for the differences that we were seeing. It was much more um, local, uh, political, and had to do with you know how big your town was, um, whether you needed that water revenue, or whether um, you know, or, or whether there were some repairs that you needed to do with your system, but you didn't do them. Um, so this was the main thing. Um, this was the, this is where you live. You can look up places near you. Um, this was a lot of the information that we, that we collected. Um, we also, we also ended up having a really huge map um, of, I don't know if it's going to load because it's fairly big. Um, this, this web, this network of how many sellers and buyers there are in the region, um, which we also based, um, we started with, oh no, where is it? Well, oh, here it is. OK. I think the flow chart is a little. I don't know if it's that much easier to understand, but there are, you know, in the publicly managed universe, um, there are lots of there are big players. So here's Chicago, and this is the amount of water that it takes in from the lake, and then distributes. Um, here's the page, buys from Chicago, but also resells to these towns. Here are some other towns. Oops, oops. And this came from the um, Illinois State Water Survey. They had done something that looked like this for 2012. Um, we wanted to update it with data that we um, hand compiled from the PDFs that have to be, or with the forms that have to be filed with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, and we wanted to update you know, the links and the width of those. Um, of those lines for who's, who's the one that gets the most water from the lake, sends it off to, to other communities. Um, yeah, go ahead. So yeah. I just wanted to um, talk a little bit, uh, if I could, about sort of overarching things that we found, uh, because uh, you know, we're talking a lot about sort of you know, the, the, the details, but I think the, 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 the stuff that we got, um, the, the sort of the most response on were uh, basically kind of three overall trends that we found. Uh, one of which was, uh, on average, uh, communities that were predominantly minority paid 20% uh, more for their water, the same amount of water, than communities that were predominantly white. Uh, the, and, and it also aligned along, um, along uh, income levels so that uh, the communities that were in the bottom 10% of uh, income paid, I think it was 31% more for the same amount of water than folks who were in the upper 10%, the highest 10% income. So those are kind of the things that broke down uh, along uh, uh, income and, um, and race lines. Uh, which were very powerful results of a lot of the work that, um, that Cecilia had to grind through. Um, and thirdly was what Patrick specialized in, which was the, uh, the water loss. So he was talking about the large water loss. I'm, I'm going to let him talk a little bit more in detail about that. But uh, in 2016, there were 44 billion gallons of water lost. That's with a B, 44 billion gallons of water lost from the time it got pulled out of Lake Michigan to the time it reached people's taps. 
And that is, I think, $25 million lost in that year alone. So and maybe, Patrick, do you want to talk a little bit about um, any more details on that? Or Okay. So the other thing about the water loss, maybe to take you back a little bit further, it might be interesting to come up with how we arrived at sort of these two main things. We were, were had this data sets for rates. We wanted to determine rates. But then also we had all this information coming into IDNR about loss. And then when you looked at the numbers, you realized how much they were losing. But also that um, IDNR had this level uh, that they want communities to stay under, but they sort of take this um, tactic that they're going to work collaboratively with the community. So there's, no, in essence, there's not really any penalties for losing tons and tons of water. And part of the reason is because it's very, very difficult for communities, even affluent communities, to keep their water within the system uh, from the lake all the way to the faucet or your shower or your wash or whatever. And so um, we found in talking to these communities, and maybe if you could pull up like part two, we could go through. So we, we sort of, once we got down to the communities that were losing the most amount of water, Maywood, um, right, go back up just to the right, stop right there. Uh, yeah, so we found this paragraph here. In addition to the 1.66 million that Maywood residents lost for all their wasted water, and then we, we went through, and this is all information that was submitted to the state, here's how much money they were losing for water. In other words, water that never made it anywhere. It leaked into the ground through uh, water main breaks or the, the things that people probably pay attention to the most, but uh, uh, other smaller leaks that were never detected. So we found Homewood, Flossmoor, East Hazelcrest, Pose and Burnham. A lot of you're seeing a theme there of South Suburban communities, um, some of which are less affluent than the others. Uh, and so then we needed to contact them and say, hey, what's going on? And as you might imagine, they were a little apprehensive. Hey, we're going to call this community. You're losing a ton of water. What's going to happen? And it was surprising that they were like, yeah, this is happening. We, we, we have a big problem here. We're losing a ton of water, and we're trying to do our best to do it, uh, to solve it. But we don't have the money to fix it, or um, but that is essentially what was happening. Or we're trying to get money from the state, or we're trying, and, and some would say that's why we're charging so much for water, is because we're trying to fix our system. And so uh, what struck me was that it was sort of this vicious cycle of charging a lot for water, water seeping away, never getting, then charging more for water, but never f having enough to fix the pipes. And so um, to almost to a town, they were like, yeah, this is a problem, and we're, we're doing our best to, to try to fix it. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any thing to add? Yeah. That was basically, I mean, that was an overview of the process, the main findings. Um, we, uh, yeah, I think Patrick. we're ready to open up. Oh, so Patrick brought along some official reporting documents right here, folks. Low, low tech <laughs> reporting. I just brought this because I thought on the way out the door I might bring, uh, I, on here I have rates. So what we did was we had a uh, Google document when we just, when we need to go through all the different towns and cross check our data or go through and confirm our data, we divided it up between the three of us plus our editor was gracious enough to take, but we all had 40, 40 towns, towns, 40 right? towns that we had So in here are all of the emails back and forth that I had with towns about, okay, so if I'm doing my math correctly, is 561 for 100 cubic feet of water, the minimum mo monthly quarterly water charge of 56, so on and so forth. So every town was different. Um, they all calculated their water rate a little bit differently. Some of them it was a flat, here's what we charge per 1,000 gallons. But for the most part, then they had meter fees, uh, store, some can we tried to take out storm water and sewer, as Cecilia mentioned, but also uh, infrastructure fees. And so it is as a way to get around charging, uh, having you say, oh, what's my water rate? If their, their water rate is going up, they would pass these little fees and tack that onto your bill. Uh, and so that, so that was the challenge of the reporting, is to go through, and so then we would note our arithmetic and double check each other's data 
um, to make sure that we were having apples to apples comparisons. So I just brought this as a as a friendly reminder to myself of all the work that we did. That He's going to pass that on. Uh, and I don't know that we talked specifically about the disparity in rates, how vast they were. I know we talked about uh, Ford Heights, uh, which is a south suburb, many of you know, predominantly black, predominantly low income, um, has a rate of $85, flat rate. Um, Evanston, a lot of you folks know, uh, has a, for 5,000 gallons of water, $85, uh, it's a flat rate, but that applied for 5,000 gallons of water, $85 in Ford Heights. Evanston, about $17, I think it was. Chicago, many of you may know, it's around $19 or $20. Uh, Highland Park, I think, was, uh, yeah. So, so you could you, you can start to see, and that's one of the values of uh, that uh, um, that drop down about rates. You, know, you can look up your community. What was really cool about it was you could see in that um, color-coded range where your uh, community lined up. So. It's just, I mean, I just really, it's like, <laughs> I, there was a part of me that thought, we don't really need to do anything but put this thing in the, uh, you know, online because it's, it's just really so informative and in such a concise uh, place. But, so, um, so it was very illuminating for all of us, I think, to, um, you know, crunch through that data that Cecilia did and then uh, these trends emerged. It was really eye-opening. Can you talk more about the GS library that you use to make the graphics and visuals? Yes. Um, so that lookup was, I tried to um, use just vanilla JavaScript as much as possible. There were going to be a lot of pictures and a lot of videos with the story, and I wanted to make sure that we weren't loading more things than we needed. Um, I, what? What about the mapping? Oh, I'm, I'm fairly certain. So the graphic that you saw, the big network graphic, um, that wasn't done by me. That was done by um, Chad Yoder in the graphics department um, it, at the Tribune. He, was, he went back and forth with um, the Illinois State Water Survey. They provided him with, um, I believe they were SVGs. So he took them into Illustrator, and he also went over the um, over the data that we parsed from the LMOs, um, that's the forms that needed to be filed with the state with the water laws and, um, and also water intake figures. And then he, I think he, he did that map by hand and I'm, I think he worked um, mostly in Illustrator. The lookup, yeah, I, that tried to be just JavaScript without other libraries as much as possible. Um, I think Chosen. JS was a little drop down, um, but everything else was, um, yeah, everything else was not, not, not D3, not any of that. Um, yeah, sorry. So next question, Let's see if we get a little. Uh, what, what were reasons for difference in what poor community paid and what wealthy communities paid? Or related, do race affluence appear to be the causes of the differences, or do they appear to be more correlated markers for true underlying causes? Yeah, it's a complicated answer, um, but I would say that uh, there there are a couple of three factors that all came into play. One, um, a lot of the communities where uh, there was uh, had, had both low income and high minority populations. That, that, was, that occurred in a lot of places. And in many of those places, they were old communities which had been losing not only population, but um, commercial and industrial tax base. So the people and the, uh, the ability for this community to pay its bills was shrinking while the infrastructure was getting older and older and deteriorating more. And, um, and while it deteriorates more, uh, the, loss, the water loss goes way up. And when that starts to happen, they have to, pay, uh, they have to charge higher rates because they don't have a Costco or they don't have a, uh, some sort of a manufacturing company there anymore. Um, so it's got to be a, the, the, the folks who are already living there are going to have to pay the, the freight, pay, pay for the bill. 
so we, we that was that's kind of generally how that shook down, um, and in a way, uh, what sort of kept these communities in a stalemated position was that uh, when we would reach out to these uh, municipal leaders and ask them, you know, you guys are losing 38% of your water. I mean, what are you gonna do about that? Well, they would turn around and tell us, you know, our, our constituents are folks that are not making a lot of money. I mean, they are trying, they are um, really struggling just to pay their day-to-day -day expenses. You think I'm gonna be able to charge them another 20 or 15, uh, 15 or 20, 25 dollars a month for, for water, it's gonna kill them. They're not gonna be able to handle it. So what, what, am, I, what am I supposed to do, some of these folks would say. So um, that's kind of the long explanation. I don't know if I covered everything in it, but a lot of it had to do with uh, just kind of the, 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 the age, the history of the community and, uh, and the fact that it was sort of shrinking. Yeah, I think in some ways um, it was a story that hadn't been done looking at water, but it was also a story that um, that not a lot of people were that surprised by. Another story where people who don't have as much money are paying the most for basic services. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we we did we stayed away from predictive models. Um, so when we when we're talking about our findings, we weren't trying to, yeah, we weren't trying to predict what would happen if we had a hypothetical town with, you know, this makeup of people or this much um, median income. Um, so the, I mean, the fairly basic descriptive uh, findings that we have are, are, you know, your average, your median, your standard deviation, things like that. I add one other quick thing, uh, example, two towns. Indian Head Park was the, the highest uh, rate that we found, $87.50. Indian Head Park is a fairly affluent, almost all white community. Uh, and the next highest rate, very comparable to it, was Ford Heights at $85 a month, uh, uh, you know, $85 for, flat, for a flat fee of water. And the differences in what was happening in those two communities was very distinct. In Indian Head Park, they had committed to a, a, a restoration, a rebuilding of their water system. And it's very, very expensive. And they pass the, the, the cost of that onto their, um, onto their constituents. In Ford Heights, it was, they're losing a bunch of water. They have no, uh, no tax base. And so we gotta charge these folks $85 a month, uh, $85 a month flat fee. So just an example. <laughs> Do you plan on updating this data in a year to see if these water providers make changes, perhaps because of your reporting? I'm not going to do Make any promises? Don't give our editors any idea. Uh, <laughs> Actually, yeah, we, we did have um, one editor was very interested in, in doing this survey and pushing the state and seeing what is different in a year or two years. That did, that has come up. Um, I, but the, the actual question was if we were planning on updating the data. I don't know. Um, I would really want to keep updating the data um, just, to, just to not let this join the cemetery of really great reporting with underlying data that kind of goes stale or nobody takes a look at and nobody can work with. Um, yeah. Uh, water can go through several cellars between the lake and the tap. If there is any general pattern, how does each step in the chain play into the final price? Uh, what is the Illinois and federal law on how these prices may be set? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm, so the general law on how the prices can be set, it's local based. Um, so your village board has final say on what the rate increases will be for your town for that year and future years. So when we were doing our reporting and when we were trying to figure out what is the sound charge for water and what are we going to double check when we talk to them, uh, we would go online and look at their ordinances and see what had been passed. Oftentimes, um, you know, the last year if there hadn't been an ordinance since 2013, then whatever rates were there were still in effect. And um, so it's, it's all local base, there is not a cap on 
how high water can be. I know that um, the, um, there was a, I don't know if it's still taken up, there was an ordinance that tried to um, be passed in Chicago that would look at affordability and try to provide water credits to people who made under two times the um, poverty um, standards set by I'm not sure, but I don't think it went anywhere. I think that was Carlos Rosa that was trying to take that on, and then he um, went for U.S. Congress and then stopped. Um, so I don't know what the what the state of affordability, at least in Chicago, would be. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's all up to your village board or your city council. If they have seven people on the on the committee or on the council, four people want a, a rate increase, it goes through. There's no state oversight. There's no other accountability except for if you want to vote those folks out because you think they, they screwed you on, their, on your rates. Um, uh, one of the, part three of the series, which we didn't talk about much, uh, gets into a little bit about this. There's a, there's a movement now toward uh, privatization of water systems. And we took a look in part three of our series. Oh, oh. oh I had one thing to say about the, about the legal stuff. Um, there was one follow-up there, so if a lakefront community one decides to charge outrageous rates for uh, their water, can they get away with that? A long time ago, I think there was a case, it was Chicago versus Niles, it was the suburban communities making that case uh, precisely, saying we have to pay not just for infrastructure, but also for our maintenance, or we don't only have to pay for our maintenance costs, we have to pay Chicago for what we buy from them, and Chicago gets both the money that uh, we're paying it and also gets money from its own residents to pay for whatever. Um, we, are, we, are saying that, uh, we are saying that they're charging us more than they should. And I believe the outcome of that, of that suit was that just because you get charged different, um, different rates doesn't necessarily mean that they are, um, that they are, uh, uh, that they're illegal or that they're out of bounds. Just because they're different doesn't mean that there's, you know, that there's something unlawful there. I think that was the last time that this suburban versus Chicago um, question came up and tried to, you know, be, be put forth. Um, as far as affordability, um, I, I think we hinted at it in the stories that EPA had developed some guidelines a long time ago in the 90s, and that was basically, it was very simple. Um, it tried to gauge whether the amounts that you paid throughout the year, um, how they, how they compare to what you were earning for that year, what your median income was. I think follow-ups to what that standard is have wanted to take a look at not just the median, but you know, what about the, fir the upper quartile, the lower quartile? How does affordability change if you are just you know, dividing your income um, by how much you're paying for water or the other way around to see how much uh, of your income is going to water? But I think as far as the uh, Illinois law, um, that, that's it. Yeah. So do you want to just answer this question? Sure. Uh, you said Indian Hills had the highest rate of ahead of Philip Hills. Uh, who has the lowest rate? I think it's Evanston, right? I think Evanston had the lowest rate. Yeah. And, uh, and Evanston was uh, like 15 or <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew this was really well, but, I, but, it, uh, but it's, it's very low. It's like somewhere in the range of 13 to 15, and as I, I think I said earlier, Chicago is like 19 to 20. Very low, those are very low. The average, I think, is, what is it, $44 to see? So. And Evanston gets its water directly from the lake. Right, so there are a lot of those communities that are close into the lake, particularly on the North Shore, that have their own cribs or their own intake systems. There's probably four, four or so of them that have yeah. Um, okay. There was the initial part of the law question was what are the changes to the if if distance alone doesn't account for the big disparities in price and what does it do? You do see a price markup um, as it goes along. So, but that that's often like a dollar that's tacked on to your per thousand gallon wholesale rate. 
So I think we have time for one more question before we get to the hacking portion of the evening. Let's see if we get a good one. Um, this investigation seemed really effort intensive. What would it take to scale up so that this kind of information could be widely available to the public geographically or keeping up to date? Patrick hasn't uh, spoken uh, in a while. Uh, he's got to answer the tough question. He's got an answer. <laughs> um, I don't know if I do have an answer. Uh, I guess it would, uh, number one would be uh, making uh, the, our information public, but I think also it might be... Well, that one is public. Uh, but I mean, I think pairing perhaps with somebody like uh, the Metropolitan Planning Council or the nonprofits of the area, uh, and I'm completely speaking off the cuff here, but to have a collaborative like Chicago Tribune with um, another reporting partner or the agency to say, hey, here's this information that's out here, here's what we did, uh, here's this information, and then uh, because you know we're the re reporters, we, you might be able to pair up with more advocacy groups who would then be able to take that information and run with it. Um, I'm just kind of making that up as I go. Uh, but that would that would be what I would say um, to answer that question. But and updating it, I think, would be kind of up to either us or the editors whether they wanted us to, to stay on it. But you're right. Like the the down of that is that you know if it was took four of us several weeks to go through and double check all the data that, that we needed to get for just to double check the rates and rates are changing all the time too. So you couldn't just use the rates that we had from this project for next year because some of the rates changed the first of the year, some of them changed um, later on. So hopefully that's a answer. I think one of the pipe dreams um, would have, so to speak, <laughs> nice, nice, um, <laughs> would be um, just, it's really great to have information all in one place, um, but when we were starting, I think we would have settled for information to have been electronical, electronically available, even if it wasn't just everything in one place, and even if it wasn't you know, that data set. Like if the LMOs could have been provided um, electronically, then I think a lot of people would have tried to do this story um, a lot faster. If I think rates were more available on different towns' websites to begin with, um, that would also open up to a lot more people um, complaining about it or talking about it. That's a lot of what this comes down to. Um, I mean, there was lower populations and tax bases and things like that, but oftentimes people don't have the time, um, you know, to, to go in and complain. They have two jobs. Um, so if, if we wanted to if we wanted to scale up, I think it would it would help if if we. It sounds counterintuitive, but if we started smaller um, and made more information available to each individual town, then it would be easier to to get to the the bigger stuff later, um, or just the more the aggregated stuff later. Um, I guess one other th thing to mention might be that you probably, from the Tribune standpoint, do a better job of telling you folks and others where you can find this information yourself. So a lot of this information is available online through IDNR and uh, through ICC in terms of the uh, that's Illinois Commerce Commission for the privatization aspect, which can't wait to take too much time talking about. But um, a lot of this information is out there, but people either don't know it's out there, or they don't know where to look, they don't have time. Thankfully, that was sort of our job is find this information, find out how to bring it all together, and then find the people that were affected by it. Um, so we could probably have, um, you know, or, or future reporting could say, here's where you find this information. Here's where you can access the ICC or the IDNR database. Um, here's where you can make complaints um, about your, your water rates if you're run by a private company. Here's when you're uh, here's a, a running calendar of um, meetings that are going to be held for water rates. Just another idea. Okay. 